on our call today, we on our call today, we will present a summary of the findings of our report, and I will then be joined by a panel of market practitioners representing an issuer, an institutional investor, a sell side bank that works with issuers to bring new green bonds to the market and a trading marketplace. Um, but before I introduce our panel, um, by way of introduction, um, here are a couple of definitions about green bonds and the greenium um, before we kick off. So. Um, green bonds, as a reminder, are bonds issued with the proceeds designed to be exclusively used for green um, or environmentally positive purposes. Um, and at CBI, we have been tracking this market for many years and even screen all issued green bonds in, in our database, where we then opine on, on whether we agree the proceeds are, are green or not. Um, and from a bond maths perspective, the issuer is responsible to pay back the interest and the principal of all of its bonds and therefore whether a bond is green or not should not make a difference to its price um, as is the same issuer risk associated with you know green bonds and, and non-green bonds um, and green bonds should display the same price as their non-green comparable equivalents uh, but it's not always the case and for many years a phenomenon has been observed whereby the the price of bonds um is is higher if they're green compared to their non-green equivalents and this is what's called the greenium and this is what we've been tracking in all our research series and so on this iteration today we will discuss does it still exist and why and what is the sort of market practitioners experiences around it and i would like to now introduce you to my colleague caroline harrison who heads our market intelligence research here at uh, CBI, um, and I believe is the person who actually first coined the term greenium. So over to you, Caroline, for a summary of uh, the situation of the research paper. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you everyone for joining uh, our webinar. It's great to be here and have the opportunity to complete a 14th paper uh, on this really, uh, you know, never ending uh, topic of whether or not green bonds can indeed uh, achieve preferential pricing. So I'm just going to go through a short, and it really is short, uh, presentation describing five highlights of the paper that we have published um, today. So, you know, before I start, I just want to explain that the paper uh, the green bond pricing in the primary market, H1 2022, discusses loads of different aspects of green bond pricing. And it's actually sort of, you know, around sort of eight to 10 miniature studies uh, all in one. So the highlights that I'm going to touch upon today uh, are by no means, uh, you know, the complete picture of everything that we've published on. So please, you know, if you find the time, uh, just have a read through the paper. So first of all, just to set the scene um, in H1, it was uh, quite a busy half um, with uh, volumes of green bonds being just 1% lower than they had been in the prior half year. This is not necessarily what you would expect, uh, given the backdrop of uh, macroeconomic challenges, uh, central banks withdrawing their support and interest rate uh, interest rates beginning to uh, go up and then also uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia did not uh, help with market stability and and you know these are things that could feasibly cause issuers to withdraw um, from the market but anyway as I said you know the result was that uh, issuance of green bonds was just one percent less than it had been in the prior half year and this pricing paper includes uh, the largest volume of green bonds that we've ever looked at so we looked at uh, 96 individual bonds for this paper worth an uh, effective total of 93 uh, billion dollars so it's a decent number of bonds so the conclusions, in other words, are quite reliable. Uh, so I'm just going to go through five highlights of the paper, as I said. The first highlight uh, is something that, the, that we sort of repeatedly mention each time we publish this paper, which is uh, Green Bonds um, did very, very well uh, and, 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 and generated more interest on average than vanilla equivalents in H1. 2022. They achieved larger book cover 
um, and that enabled uh, larger spread compression in the primary market. 20% of the bonds that we build yield curves for achieved what we call a greenium, which means that they priced inside their own yield curve. Now that means uh, that those bonds uh, were sold at a higher price than other debt uh, on, on the, of uh, that issuer was uh, trading in the secondary market at that time. Um, and 20% of bonds is equivalent to 10 individual securities. So this uh, is something that we see as value for issuers. So this is a reason really for issuers to come to the market uh, and put a green label on their debt. Our second highlight is that green bonds tightened in the immediate secondary market. Um, this is something that we have uh, repeatedly seen uh, throughout all of our studies. So after seven and 28 days, we see that green bonds on average tighten by a larger magnitude than both vanilla baskets uh, and corresponding indices in the secondary market. And we see this as being benefit for investors because uh, immediately the bonds go into the secondary market, the price increases. Uh, the third highlight of the paper is based on uh, our first study of sustainability linked bonds. So we looked at uh, a sample of sustainability linked bonds issued in 2021 and the first half of 2022 to determine whether there was any evidence of a greenium, and indeed there was. Uh, so the greenium we noted was more obvious among US dollar denominated bonds and definitely more obvious in 2021 compared to the first half of 2022. Um, so SLBs, we conclude, can help issuers to achieve pricing benefits uh, in the primary market compared to vanilla equivalents. Um, as said, you know, this was observed more frequently among the dollar denominated bonds. And there are a couple of reasons for this, which we highlight in the paper. Uh, one of them is that, you know, in the dollar denominated market, there tends to be less choice uh, of large uh, liquid green bonds with adequate transparency. So SLBs are kind of stepping into this space by offering uh, a sustainability label on, on a large uh, liquid bond. And the names that are issuing these bonds uh, tend to be from a very diverse range of sectors, and the names tend to be very relatable to um, investors. So from this, we conclude investors are willing to support uh, a large range of issuers on their sustainability journey. Uh, the fourth highlight is based on a study that we did using some trade web data, where we looked at the liquidity profile of green bonds in the secondary market compared to non-green equivalents. So for this, uh, we chose the real estate space and the utility space in euro-denominated uh, green and vanilla bonds. Um, and you know the reason why we chose those two sectors is because uh, there are a decent number of green and non-green bonds uh, in both of them. So we noticed uh, that indeed, uh, green bonds did maintain a better liquidity profile in the secondary market, and this confirms the results of a similar study um, that we had done uh, a year earlier. So altogether, you know, this could help this, this sort of uh, improved profile of liquidity in the secondary market uh, can give uh, investors more flexibility, if you like, uh, because they know that they can always sell um, a green bond. And this Flexibility is kind of priceless uh, and could help to justify types of pricing for green bonds in the primary market where that was present. Uh, lastly, we observed uh, that among the euro denominated bonds, more of the bonds from the real estate and utility sectors had green label on than did not. Okay, so that means that real estate uh, issuers in euros and utility issuers uh, are preferring the green label. Um, and we also note in the paper that real estate bonds were among the strongest performers um, outright. So strong definitions of these sec in these sectors and early definitions uh, have made it very easy uh, for issuers to bring green bonds to the market. And it seems now that there's pressure coming from 
all sources. So, for example, you know, um, issuers are being asked by their brokers uh, whether they're going to put a green label on their paper if it's in the real estate or the utility space in particular. Uh, and, you know, real estate um, companies have mentioned to us uh, that their uh, their clients who, who rent their buildings are asking them if they've issued a green bond because that allows them to comply with their own sustainability objectives. Uh, we noted that the picture is very different in the US and we're hoping that uh, culture and policy uh, will catch up to ensure that green capital expenditure receives the same priority that it does in Europe. So those are the five highlights uh, of our paper. And just a couple of words on the outlook, where do we think the market's going to go? So although we think uh, interest rate rises are going to continue for the foreseeable future, and we think geopolitical tensions indeed uh, are also going to continue, we expect uh, the strong dynamics in the green bond market to prevail uh, within that context. So we see a shift in investor preference towards green bonds, uh, and this is driven by regulation that's coming from the EU and others, uh, including SFDR, which is driving demand for green bond. There's a growing number uh, of ETFs, so uh, secondary market buyers with a green label on them, and green bonds more than ever now, because uh, they are being issued in benchmark size in dollars and euros, are qualifying for benchmark indices. So there's this additional source of demand coming from uh, mainstream investors who may have green bonds in mainstream bond indices. Uh, the second point that we note in our outlook is the Inflation Reduction Act, which recently been passed in the US, could inspire uh, more issuance in US dollars. So historically, and we've mentioned this repeatedly, um, there is a lack of large green bonds with adequate transparency coming in US dollars. Uh, and we hope uh, that, you know, the IRA, which includes a spending plan on renewable energy, zero emission vehicles, energy efficient buildings, and so on, will encourage more issuance in this space, giving investors more opportunity to, uh, you know, introduce dedicated mandates. Uh, we would like to see more sovereign issuance supporting the market. Austria became the 13th member of the EU27 to join the market, and there are 14 sovereigns in the EU that still have not issued green bonds. So we're looking forward uh, to seeing that over the coming years. Um, you know, sovereigns are really going to be uh, the source of growth in this market and will contribute to the required five trillion uh, in green bonds annually that we expect to be issued in the near future. Uh, you know, from the perspective of sovereigns, we do note in our paper uh, that investors do like green bonds from sovereigns. And in fact, France and Germany both reopened green bonds in the first half of 2022. And because their bonds were inside their yield curves, they were able to extend the pricing benefits of those. Uh, so uh, that's the end of the presentation today. As I've said, please go to the website, have a look at the paper, uh, let us know what you think. And Elizabeth, uh, I will hand back to you for a panel discussion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Caroline. There's definitely a lot to unpack there. Um, and I would like to introduce our, our panel um, who are joining us for, for, for further discussion about the report findings. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank our panel for taking the time to uh, to join us today. Um, we I think we're going to have an, an interesting discussion and I would like to maybe invite each panelist to introduce themselves, um, in particular their, 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 their name, their role and the institution. Um, we will start with you, Christian. Yes, hello, hi. Uh, my name is Christian Engelen. I'm the head of unit uh, boring and lending in the European Commission. We have, um, since the last two years, become one of the main um, uh, issuers uh, in the SSA market uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and as part of our um, biggest funding program, we have also launched um, a very sizable green bond uh, program uh, and already issued quite sizable amounts, but there's a lot more to come. So um, we're very happy to share our views here in this panel from an, from an issuer perspective. 
Thank you, Christian. And we definitely have some questions for you about how the experience has been uh, issuing green bonds at that scale. Um, and next, I would like to introduce Lizzie Nicol, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lizzie Nicol. I'm a portfolio manager in the index fixed income team at BlackRock. Um, I focus mainly on multi-sector global aggregate funds, um, but also our global green bond fund and our euro green bond fund. That's, thank you so much, Lizzie. Um, and uh, next on the banking side, we have George Timont. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. So, George Timont, nice to, to, to be discussing um, this topic with you all. Um, I'm head of ESG syndicate at Credit Agricole. Um, given our place in the market, we're one of the leading underwriters. We see a lot of flow come across our desk in the ESG space, and that's across sectors. It's globally as well. Um, so very happy to be involved in this discussion. Thank you, George. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have some interesting color from you on, on issuance trends and, and uh, outlook. Um, and I would like also to introduce you to Heather Wooten. Heather. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning for those of you who are on the East Coast of the United States, like myself. I'm Heather Wooten, and I'm the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility and ESG at TradeWeb. And I'm looking forward to kind of bringing the secondary market perspective into this conversation. Um, we've been a partner with the Climate Bonds Initiative uh, now since early 2021, tracking green bond trading in the secondary market. So looking forward to kind of discussing that with you all today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Thank you all. Um, and the um, the first question I had was maybe for Christian, uh, from the point of view of, of, of an issuer in the green bond market space. Um, and we, we wanted to get your, your comments on, on the report findings. And, um, and as you mentioned earlier, the European Union um, has been a huge issuer with the first green bond launched um, in October last year. Um, for a size of 12 billion euros, and then that was tapped this year. Um, and then two new green bonds were launched um, this year for a combined size of, of 11 billion euros, I believe. Can you share your experience as an issuer? Did you witness the Greenium at play? And was that an important consideration for you? Yes, very happy to do so. I, I should mention that um, in terms of the dimensions, um, we have should quite sizable amounts uh, in individual transactions, but as I said, um, we will build this out quite significantly. Just to give you a few numbers, we we, we have been mandated uh, by our member states to implement a program with an overall volume of a uh, little over 800 billion until 2026, uh, and up to 30% of this issuance is supposed to be in the form of green bonds. So there is um, quite a sizable amount of green bonds um, to be issued over the the coming years um, and what we've seen was, was just the beginning. Uh, however, what we also experienced, and I, I must say, I find myself very well um, reflected in this report, uh, at least the experience we have made. Um, the uh, uh, experience from an issuer perspective is indeed that um, investors exhibit a very strong demand for um, particularly green uh, issuance. Um, we have also a social bond program but um, the, um, the, the demand is stronger on the, on, on the ecological side to it. Um, and there's um, certainly still uh, an undersupply or an over demand in the market that we see. And that is what I would also interpret into the findings on the pricing with regard to a greenium that this is a reflection of still a structural imbalance. So I think that um, investors have, um, done the transition towards a more um, uh, or exercising more choice in, in, in structuring their investment strategies and integrating sustainability dimensions into their, into their investments faster than uh, the, the, the issuers could uh, catch up with, with uh, sufficient supply. Of course, of, it is for the issuer more um, challenging to uh, basically repackage um, um, uh, uh, their um, expenditures to make sure that the, the structures and the frameworks are in place which are necessary to underpin in a credible manner this kind of issuance. So I think this is absolutely natural and understandable that 
uh, the demand is faster than the supply here. And this is also what we see in the market. For us as a big issuer, we are still benefiting from that, given that we have our framework in place, given that we have a big uh, issuance pipeline um, and we are, as I said, enjoying a little bit the privileges there. And in terms of the, um, the 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 green name itself, so that wasn't particularly a you know a consideration to issue more. For example, you you had your program defined in advance, and and you know the green name was a wasn't a factor of decision in the issuance program. I, you know, from from an issuer perspective, particularly when you talk about the green bond program of uh, north of two hundred billion, you. You think it's nice to have a greenium, but if you do that only for a greenium, you, you're probably destined for, for failure. So for us, the prime objective is to make sure that um, we can place this program with the specialized investors, that we can um, build a, um, a, a sustainability segment in our general issuance, which is um, uh, uh, providing a proper choice to investors. Um, whether that leads to a greenium in an individual transaction, yes or no, is something which is a nice to have for us, but we are not chasing a greenium. Um, and uh, I've mentioned that before. For me, also, the greenium is something which is um, a transitory um, element in all of that. Uh, given that I've mentioned it, uh, I see there is structural imbalance between demand and supply. I would assume that the issuers uh, across the world on the private sector side, also on the public sector side, will ramp up their, their, their green bond issuance, their sustainability bond issuance, and will by that fill the gap between demand and supply. You've indicated it on the sovereign side. There are 14 member states still not part of the, the green bond club. Um, if they ramp it up, uh, the supply, on, at least from the sovereign side, would increase or significantly. And with this additional supply, I would assume that the gap between supply and demand will be closed over time. So I would, I, I said, I would not as an issuer try to build my green bond um, strategy only on a, on a pricing advantage based on a green. No, that makes a lot of sense. And um, one day, Caroline, we will not need this report anymore because the findings will be everything's on par. But for the, for the time being, you still have this job to do, um, and um, so Christian mentioned the, uh, the the strong investor demand, and and maybe uh, it will be interesting to hear from you, Lizzie, as a portfolio manager. You're on the other side of the uh, of the issuing equation. Uh, you're the one deciding whether to buy those bonds or not, and which ones. Um, what's your take on on the uh, primary market pricing me mechanism? Um, does it make it difficult to justify to clients why you're buying green versus non-green? What's, what's your experience as an investor? Um, well, well, yeah, the greenium is certainly something that we're monitoring pretty closely, both in the primary market, excuse me, and in the secondary market. Um, you know, we look at uh, ESG risk as investment risk. So actually, it does make sense for green bonds to be trading um, tighter than their traditional counterparts. Um, as for justifying it to clients, um, I think it's less of an issue for me as an index portfolio manager. Clients tend to come to us looking for more ESG, sustainable green bond exposure. And, you know, green bonds is one of the tools that we can offer to, to help provide that. And that could be um, by making green bonds a certain set percentage of their portfolio, or they could be using one of our green bond funds as part of um, building blocks for their wider portfolios. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I dare speak on behalf of an active portfolio manager, again, I think clients come to them, you know, they want to increase their exposure to these kind of investments. Um, but perhaps in practice, they just need to be a bit more selective about um, what they buy and where they buy. And it probably makes sense to yeah, take advantage of primary market issuance rather than trying to source anything that's quite illiquid and quite expensive on the secondary market. That, that, that's fair. And uh, we'll come back to you with some some um, questions on the sort of broader demand trends. Um, but I did want to um, move to George to ask you, um, in terms of the, the conversations that you're having with, uh, with issuers as, as they prepare to launch green bonds, um, do they care about the premium? Do they ask you about it? Um, and what is your experience in terms of how execution dynamics compare? Sure, I think... 
Look, when we're discussing accessing the green bond market, the green union conversation comes up with almost all issuers. Um, I think one of the points to, to, to the discussion Christian put forward is it's one of the reasons that issuers come to this market. And if you start to base a strategy, as Christian said, then you may become unstuck at some point. Um, I think one of the interesting points, the, the EU being one of the biggest issuers of green bonds, we actually see on their curve one of the strongest greeniums. So that demand is still certainly outstripping supply, even for the largest issuers that we have in the market. Um, but I think when, when, when looking at greenium and discussing that with issuers, I think we're still certainly seeing a pricing benefit for a majority of the green bonds that we do execute in, in primary markets. One of the points, certainly in recent months since you know February or March this year, it's become increasingly difficult to strip out that greenium. Um, if I look at the research Caroline's put, put forward and, and obviously agree with many of those points, and we see that borne out in, in the trades that we execute, I think in a way the, the analysis of greenium in the, the CBR report is in some ways conservative because it's about pricing at or through um, the yield curve of the issuer. Um, but when we're assessing the benefit for issuing green, we can make an argument as well that in this market where spreads, rates are very volatile, and indeed new issue concessions that have to be paid are quite volatile, it's increasingly hard to strip out the greenium. But equally, in some cases, we can see the argument, for example, if an issuer had to pay a 10 basis point concession for a equivalent conventional trade and we felt that actually on that transaction they paid five basis points then we could argue the benefit to the issuer of coming to the um, new issue market with a green trade was five basis points so that's also one of the conversations we're having in these particularly volatile markets where it's hard to, to necessarily be pricing through curves but it's about showing the benefit um, of issuing in green format um, but but clearly it's one of the benefits um, Again, as Christian alluded to, there's numerous benefits. I think one of the, the other strongest points is investor diversification, um, not just new investors, but unlocking extra pools of liquidity within the existing buyer base for that issuer. And that's something we can see strongly with the very dedicated um, ESG investors. Um, it's potentially about accessing different currencies and different tenors where we feel that the green label helps access those investors who are open to those currencies or tenors, um, navigating volatile markets. And I think this is all in addition to the, obviously the communication factors, which are, are very strong for lots of the issuers who are coming to the market with ESG label trades. Um, so there's certainly, as I said, uh, uh, we feel that there is a pricing benefit hard to extract basis points on every single trade, but I think there's also a broader benefit, which clearly issuers do see, as you highlighted, Caroline, that issuance um, in the green space is, is only increasing. And actually we're seeing uh, quite a strong bounce back of green issuance versus other ESG labels, particularly in the Euro space this year. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, George. And that, that does match the, the, the um, kind of findings in the report. Um, and going back to the um, to the benefits and practice of of the green bonds, um, Heather, uh, offer and demand dynamics clearly are one of the the factors that explains th th these uh, pricing dynamics. And thinking about what happens after the green bond is launched, um, at TradeWeb you have a huge marketplace for secondary market trading, and and um, within the uh, you, that universe of securities you can track green bond volumes and. Uh, looking at the trading volumes specifically for the first half of, of this year, can you give us a sense of you know what the volume of trading was in green bonds um, and how does it compare to the market overall? Like, is it a tiny niche awkward market with strange pricing dynamics, or is it pretty pretty huge? Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Happy happy to tackle that. And I think just to kind of quickly take a, a step back for a bit of context about kind of trade web and, and where we fit in. Um, you know, we're one of the leading fixed income marketplaces for green bond trading, which, as you mentioned, really uniquely positions us to observe global trading trends in the secondary market. And for you know a long time now, have been kind of keen to support sustainable finance more broadly, which you know, ultimately led us to joining the Climate Bonds Initiative Partners Program back in, in early of last year. And with that partnership, you know, we've been tracking and reporting trade web screen bond volumes executed globally across all products, as well as using a Climate Bonds Initiative green bond data to highlight green bonds for our clients across our global screens. And I think it's a, a, a point that's really critical for us um, is to have that level of 
rigorous screening and integrity that you do provide kind of that you mentioned in the beginning of this call so that when clients are, are viewing green bonds on screen they have that trust and that transparency um, that's critical uh, in the market today when they see that label on screen um, so i guess moving kind of overall to trends that we're seeing uh, in the market and secondary market trading i think really there's three three large trends to touch on First, we see continued momentum in volumes, uh, green bond volumes traded on the platform year over year. So our CVI screened green bond trading across global markets on TradeWeb reached almost 121 billion just for the first half of this year alone, which represents a 44% increase in green bond trading as compared to the first half of 2021, which is still a significant increase given you know, what, what we've mentioned on, on the call so far, which was a slight slowing or decrease in issuance, especially in the first quarter of this year. The second point is that we continue to see strong investor demand for green bonds, which you know we've talked about um, on this call already as well. And really, this is evident to us not only when talking to investors directly, but witnessing green bond trading continue to rise regardless of market condition. In 2021, we saw a 71% increase in green bond trading volume across the platform as compared to the full year of 2020, as obviously we saw both issuance and investor demand continue to rise throughout the year into the end of 2021. And what we're seeing is that the green bond trading volumes are continuously led by European government bonds, which in our characteristics do include the European Union green bonds, uh, European credit, other government bonds uh, around the world, and U.S. high-grade credit. And finally, I think the third thing that we've witnessed is, uh, to your point, Elizabeth, actually an increase in the share of green bonds traded versus total trading volume you know, across the platform per asset class. So what really that means is, is while green bonds are uh, still kind of a, a small kind of single digit percentage range of overall trading volume on TradeWeb, what we have witnessed is that year over year, that percentage continues to rise. Um, so we're seeing more demand, more trading year over year, and that increase of green bonds versus overall trading continue to, to grow in percentage. And interestingly, European credit bonds actually show the sharpest increase in, in green volume versus other asset classes, which it now should be no surprise kind of given some of the, the findings that you shared with us, Caroline, um, and specifically in the utility and real estate sectors. And really kind of what all of that means to us is that these are all indicators these trends are likely to continue, especially as we see green bonds becoming increasingly more mainstream. Um, that's um, that's great, Heather. Thank you very much for encouraging encouraging healthy dynamics um, on the uh, on the trading side. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, if any of the panelists want to jump in with any comments, don't you know you're very welcome to uh, to to jump in. Um, I, I did have a question for George at this point, um, referring back to um, to the fact that this year was a challenging start to the year. Uh, well, not just a start, generally, uh, with a rising rates, inflation, geopolitical turmoil. Um, it's probably the the first kind of period in the life of green bonds, specifically where where rates are going high that fast, um, and that. That has had a, a knock-off effect, a knock-on effect on on issuance patterns. Um, we only saw a one percent decline in issuance of, of green bonds in our in our data set this half of the year versus the previous, you know, which is not bad considering this environment. And so, George, from the point of view of um, on the syndicate desk, are you seeing issuers being more? committed to the green bond issue plans. Um, we, I mean, we, we have heard anecdotes of issuers sort of pulling pulling off their plans to launch, except maybe the green bonds. Are, are, you, are you observing any of that? Yeah, I think from, from let's say, an issuer perspective, there's, there's more and more interest in the product. And I think that's fueling the, the, the growth in the market. As you said, if you look at volumes globally year on year, of course, we're down quite significantly. Um, but there's been quite a jump in terms of green issuance as a proportion of supply coming through, and particularly in the euro market, actually. So it's interesting to, to pick up on the euro versus dollar um, differences, as, as you touched upon. It, it's quite clear that the, the dynamics we're discussing are certainly more pronounced in the euro market. Um, and I think, interestingly, talk about plans and issuers and 
And what they're doing and committing to green, I think we do see some instances where dollar and euro markets are open to individual issuers. And the target from an issuer perspective is to really save and reserve those green eligible assets expenditures for the euro market. Um, because we see more pronounced demand, you know, a, a greater pool of dedicated funds, ESG focused funds. And that's clearly something which goes on in our discussions with issuers too. Um, and it's created that virtuous circle in a way that we see in the euro market about 25 to the plus percent of supply coming through in ESG format. Um, that's in euros globally. Um, and in the dollar market, it's more around 10%. We've seen that pattern in the last couple of years. Um, and green supply in euros as a proportion of, of ESG total supplies jumped from 50% to about 65% this year. Um, so it's some issuers choosing to access euros versus dollars, but it's also coming back to some of those points that I made in terms of the benefits of issuing green. We certainly feel there's a stickiness of investors potentially willing to accept a, a slightly you know, tighter price. Um, accessing markets in slightly more volatile conditions. Um, and we certainly feel the broader benefits of issuing in green are quite pronounced, particularly in these volatile markets, which is, is being borne out in the figures that, that you've seen and I've, I've mentioned. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you, George. And I, I do have some broader questions about trends in, in, in different regions. And Caroline, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in actually and say that what is really interesting is that it appears that the SLB market is uh, in terms of sort of the large more liquid bonds appears to be maturing more quickly in uh, US dollars compared to uh, euros in terms of currency denomination. I think that is because um, euro investors are comfortable with the use of proceeds format. Uh, they, they like the use of proceeds format and there is a supply available from a massive range of issues. So the, the euro market, as George just mentioned, is deeper and broader. You know, we have massive issues uh, from, you know, every area of the market um, supported by, uh, you know, benchmark issues such as uh, the EU and uh, you know large sovereigns. So so the market in Europe is is, is considerably more sort of liquid, deeper, broader. Uh, however, you know this this development uh, of US dollar denominated SLBs uh, and the fact that investors do appear to like them to the extent that they're willing to sort of pay through the curve for them, uh, for me is definitely uh, very very interesting, um, and in some ways sort of demonstrates. Uh, you know, the differences in, in sort of approach to responsible investment uh, between sort of the two investor types. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and I, going back to Christian and the EU plans and the huge sort of issuance there, I think all the issuance so far has been in euros. Um, and without giving us anything that's not public, obviously, are there any plans for dollar issuance? Or is at the moment, is it all in euros. Sorry, I first had to unmute myself. So um, thank you for the question. Uh, let me first come back to one point George said, because I think it's it's worth um, really pointing that out. I think he's, he, he's very right with um, pointing to the benefits in this current market environment. So um, determining a green is, is really a tricky exercise in, in a world where um, new issues and concessions are, are increasing and uh, putting a, an additional challenge to, towards the issues. By the way, can you continue to hear me? Yeah, the, uh, the line is a little bit um, patchy, Christian. Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? The, the line is not very clear. It, it's kind of dropping. Can you hear us? I think we have a, a connectivity. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're back on now. It seems to be better now. Okay. Very, very sorry. Yes, there are some, some technical issues. Um, I, I, I try to be very brief. Um, to your question. So we manage our green bond issuance as an integral part of our overall issuance strategy. So we don't uh, take a, a separate um, uh, curve management for, for the green bonds. Um, over time, it should basically also broaden out to, 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 to the whole maturity spectrum. Um, 
starting from a longer end and then you know broadening it uh, a little bit into the more medium uh, and shorter term uh, maturities. Um, and, and with that in mind, we also do not design a specific uh, issuance approach for the, for, for the green issuances, including we would not go for other currencies because we generally will not issue in other currencies. We are the issuer for the European Union um, and uh, the Euro is the currency of the European Union and this is where we issue. We also do not see um, any lack of demand in Euro um, in that segment. So the benefits are not that obvious, and for us it would be would be a big step to to issue another currency uh, for for many reasons, including also political considerations. And it seems the demand is there from from the euro component at the moment, uh, anyhow. Um, and I did actually want to ask you if um, I mean the the scale of issuance. Of, of the EU has been absolutely enormous. Did you expect the uh, oversubscription levels that you got or were you a little bit nervous going into it, uh, especially in the first half of this year? Uh, you, you mean generally, so conventional and green bonds or only related to the green bonds? Because it's a, it's a phenomenon which we have seen across all our issuances. Um, luckily, we were really lucky and um, it shows that investors have really bought into um, the product and the narrative we have brought to the market. So we, we knew that we have an attractive product to offer. It's, it's highly rated, it's um, very liquid, um, and it is basically linked to a very credible narrative behind it. Um, it's, it's offering investors a diversified exposure to the uh, Euro member states, um, or EU member states, and, and, and uh, a good asset in, 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 in Euro. So, we knew that there is a lot of interest in the market, but we were positively surprised how strong this interest is across the conventional and the green dimension. But on the green side, then on top, we were also very pleased to see that there is a very uh, strong demand and a very uh, broad investor base interested in that. Um, and it goes back to what, what George also pointed to. Uh, we see that this is really a stability anchor also in a more more challenging market environment where um, issuing with a green label can give you um, an additional um, element of stability in terms of the, the demand and uh, the investor base you're, you're approaching. So uh, it, it has turned out very well for us, um, better than, than initially uh, hoped for. Um, but of course, we also know that going further into the program and issuing more volumes, uh, probably the primary issue issuance becomes a bit more, more challenging, but over time also the secondary market liquidity will improve with, with increasing volumes, which can then help a little bit. So I think there is a, is a certain um, balance in that, and we just need to, to build on this. Um, for the moment, it's getting a bit rougher um, for all issuers, particularly big issuers, um, but we are quite confident that we are well positioned to, to go through that, and that, that's see positive narrative also resonates to support the track. That's great. Thank you very much, Christian. And we, we, we lost you a little bit for the last five seconds, but um that, that was very helpful. And I love that you answered the the, the question from the point of view of not green specifically. Um, and one day when Caroline doesn't have a job anymore analyzing the green, and we'll actually be talking about insurance patterns and you know, green will just, you know, climate friendly investments will be just what the market is made up of. Um, but uh, I'd like to move to Lizzie because you're on the opposite side of, you know, these um, issuers that are coming to the market and especially the, the, the books that are severely oversubscribed. You're there competing with all the other investors uh, trying to access these uh, these uh, bonds, and uh, you know, as, as we've discussed, uh, the demand is extremely high. Um, you run a very large book of, of fixed income assets, um, and most of them indexed, and including the the iShares Green Bond ETF and, and index funds. How difficult is it to source these new green bonds uh, with with so much demand, and uh, especially for for the popular names like uh, the EU? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we definitely see that the green bonds are more oversubscribed. Um, 
I looked at some of our stats earlier and just looking in um, Euro corporate space um, the first half of this year, um, we see the green bonds are um, 2.6 times oversubscribed or 2.6 times subscribed and the non-green 2.2. Um, I think it actually sort of differs between sector. So going back to the report and what Caroline says about utilities, you know, green bonds and utility space now are fairly standard. So perhaps there's sort of less excitement over those, um, whereas, you know, a sector where there's less green issuance, so perhaps tier two fins or even autos, um, you know, we'd really expect the demand to be high on, on those ones. Um, I had a look over our... Um, our orders for the past past sort of few weeks and our, our fill rate is anywhere between sort of 30 and 70 percent which actually isn't too dissimilar to um the conventional bonds you know i think as george was saying it's been a fairly volatile um volatile few months in in the primary market in general um so so yes in answer to your question it, it is quite challenging um it's certainly more important on the green bond portfolios that we um can get exposure to those bonds because on the um broader index portfolios that contain non-green and green bonds we can always proxy the risk of the green bonds with a with a non-green equivalent um so you know if, if we couldn't get hold it wouldn't be the case for a treasury but if or say volkswagen for example if we couldn't get hold of a volkswagen green bond we could proxy that with a, a non-green uh, bond of a similar um, maturity um the other thing i just to point out on the primary market for the for the green bond funds is i know it's out of scope for this report because we're just predominantly looking at euros and dollars um you know there's there's green bonds issued in in global currencies that are really difficult to get hold of in the secondary market so we try as much as possible to get hold of those in the primary market so it's certainly the bonds issued in danish krona uh, they're like gold dust actually in the secondary market and also um singapore dollar is proving to be pretty difficult to pick up as well so um christian issuance in danish krona potentially on the horizon um <laughs> caroline i think you had you 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 mentioned you have um, some thoughts on 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 the primary sort of a market investor experience as well yeah so so on the topic of allocations i mean we obviously approach all issuers uh, that are included in our research and we ask them what percentage of uh, their deal was allocated to, to investors describing themselves as green so uh, uh, you know acknowledging that that's pretty hard to measure and everybody obviously measures that differently uh, you know, we have seen a sort of upward trend uh, towards uh, green investor preference from uh, issuers and brokers. But what I would like to know, and perhaps Christian, this is a question for you, is uh, whether you would consider uh, using uh, the SFDR and in particular the Article 9 uh, classification to offer preferential allocations of your green bonds to investors that have really demonstrated their green credentials, thus sort of making a bit of a virtuous circle. And as an issuer, sort of doing your bit to, uh, you know, green uh, the sort of broader investment universe. It's an interesting question, and uh, certainly we have given it a lot of thought how we structure the allocation of our green bond issuances um, in order to to strike a proper balance between um, building out a broad investor base, um, but also serving the specialized investors a bit a bit better. Indeed, we. We offer a slight top up in terms of the allocation for specialized investors, um, but it's not a lot. Um, and I would personally think that over time, in any case, um, every investor, every institutionalized investor, every big institutional portfolio will need to have a green component. So the, the, the specialization becomes a bit of commodity um, in the market over time. That's the, the, the idea behind it. And I think this is also how we should think about sustainable finance in general, that it becomes just another dimension across all groups of investors and that it's not just a, a niche market for, for highly specialized investors. So I think we, we are trying to, to strike this balance by, um, by yes, giving a slight top up to specialized investors, but also serving well in the allocation non-specialized investors to to uh, pull them into the sustainable finance space and make sure that um, we support and facilitate the broadening out and the diffusion into the whole system of sustainable finance. And actually, this this might be a good place to maybe de debunk a myth um, with with Lizzie's help, where 
you know, the question to Lizzie is to what extent do you buy green bonds only for f funds or portfolios that are called green bond fund or green bond portfolio um, versus a normal corporate or aggregate or, you know, a, a fund that, that, that is eligible uh, where green bonds are eligible to buy into? Um, yeah, I mean, that's not the case at all. So we participate in the green bond new issues as we do with uh, non-green bond new issues across all of our index portfolios. So we proactively manage throughout the month towards the forward benchmark. So any bond that is going to enter, the, enter that forward benchmark, you know, we want to um, get exposure to on the primary market. Um, and we do that to minimise T costs rather than try and um, uh, rebalance in the last day of the month. Um, the slight nuance really is that the... Um, with the green bond index it the bond may not necessarily enter the index the following month because it could take up to six months for the esg provider to do their due diligence on the bond and make sure that it meets the green bond criteria um and the use of proceeds required to be eligible um but no yeah that's absolutely a myth we buy the, we buy those green um bonds across all of our index funds whether they're green or not thank you lizzie and indeed it is um it, it, it is true that the green bonds are hidden and eligible into normal fixed income indices too. So um, I think, George, did you have any comments on the on the allocation to, to you know, more specialised green investors for new issues? Yeah, I think so. Um, in a way, it's quite a it's quite a tr tricky topic. So I hesitated whether I wanted to jump in on it. It's um, I think the difficulty is uh, there's a range of metrics you can use to assess whether an investor is green. So it's quite difficult in this evolving market to really start to impact allocations in a material way towards investors, which we assess, the issuer assesses, the group of banks assess, is really buying the bonds because of the label that it has, whether it's green or another ESG label. So it's it's quite a tricky topic. And I think amongst the market, you know, there's broad consensus over to what kind of indicators um, we look towards. But I think at the moment, it's, as, as Christian said, one of the other points on the flip side of that is encouraging the broader investor base to buy into green bonds, to buy into ESG label bonds and have that as part of their strategy as well. So it's quite a fine balancing act at the moment. Um, I mean, what one thing, you know, to, <clears throat> to your point, anyone can buy a green bond for their funds. Um, one thing we, you know, can look towards is indeed the skew of, ESG bonds versus conventional within certain portfolios. And if we have that information at the time of the order, that can be used to discuss and, and see whether there is a, an increase in allocation. Um, some issuers look at it in different ways. Some like to give a slight uptick to, to green accounts. Others have a very strong view of opening it to the broader audience. Um, so at the moment, I would say there's no definitive way of, of how we treat allocations. It, it's something which I think the market has to continue to evolve. Um, and I think in terms of having the information and the disclosures, that's obviously very important if we're going to systematically implement some kind of um, allocation policy um, over and above what we generally employ. Yeah, that's uh, that's very fair. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, I think we would agree with that where it's it's not just about the... The, the, the greening of a small part of the system it's you know the the, the whole ecosystem really um that uh, that is evolving towards embracing uh you know climate in, in their investments um i did want to go back to an important point uh with heather because um you know we're talking here about the primary market but at the end of the day um the experience of, of trading these bonds is, is is extremely um interesting and i did want to ask you heather um, whether you had any comments on the differences in the liquidity profile of green bonds in the secondary market. And anecdotally, we've heard that when there are cases of, you know, credit squeeze, like we've seen this year, it's been actually easier to sell out of green bonds um, because there's always takers. So if, if you need to disinvest rapidly for, you know, from an exposure, it's actually a good instrument to have. Do you see that in your data at TradeWeb? Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. And I think, you know, kind of to start out the answer to that question, there are obviously many macro factors to consider that, that the panel has mentioned uh, when, when analyzing differences in the secondary market, specifically as it relates to green bond, that supply and demand dynamic that, that Christian alluded to um, for green bonds. But I think looking, you know, specifically at the sectors that we analyzed for this paper, you know, utility and real estate um, in the Euro credit market, we did see, um, especially in, in March of this year in particular, 
a widening uh, in the difference of the bid offer spread between green and vanilla bonds in the study. Um, green bonds exhibiting kind of at the height of, of that widening a more than three basis point tighter bid offer spread. And a tighter bid offer spread, what that indicates to us is a greater ease of trading um, in and out of that bond, which does offer that flexibility in the market. Um, we actually saw throughout the first half of 2022 for this analysis um, in this study that green bonds had a tighter bid offer spread compared to the vanilla counterparts uh, in the study for that entire period of the first half of 2022. So really what that data uh, suggests to us is that even through times of volatility, there was greater interest in trading these green bonds, um, which is seen through more competitive pricing, especially on the bid side for market participants, you know, the green versus the vanilla bonds. Um, I think which also in turn kind of supports that slightly higher turnover that we witnessed for the green bonds in the study versus vanilla as well, just over this, this first period, uh, the first half of 2022. Um, so that is uh, it's good to know that uh, that uh, benefit sort of carries on to the to the secondary markets. Um, we 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 have a, a couple of minutes left, and and maybe this is a, a good point to to see if you have any any closing comments. Uh, starting with you, Christian, maybe. Uh, no, so for us, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are still facing a a, a very big challenge, which is to roll out this program throughout the, the, the next years and to continue building together with our investors um, this um, space for us where we can place and, um, and um, see that the market can absorb these amounts of, of green bonds. Um, by, by current standard, it would be, I think, the or at least one of the largest green bond programs in the world, which itself is, is quite challenging to, to roll out. But I would assume also that we, at the end of the program, we will not be alone in that, in that league. Um, I would assume that particularly the very big issuers, the sovereigns, uh, notably, but also big SSAs, will also start rolling out quite substantial amounts of sustainable uh, uh, financing instruments um, and that this will create an ecosystem or build out further the existing ecosystems that we see. I also want to reiterate what I've mentioned that um, for me, this is not a, a, a niche um, uh, of the financial system anymore. It's a dimension which goes across the whole system uh, and it needs to give all investors uh, uh, choice um, in their investment strategy, whether they want to go for the conventional route or take a sustainability angle to that. I think that's that's something that is absolutely clear that in the future, it, it will be an element um, uh, affecting all market participants, particularly all investors, and trying to uh, encourage a more responsible uh, investment behavior. And if we can Facilitate that and, and, and contribute to that. I think that's already quite a big achievement for our Green Bond program. That's great. Thank you very much, Christian. And we'll be we'll be following with uh, great interest and, and support the the continuation of the program. Um, Lizzie, any any final thoughts on your side? Do do do, do you foresee kind of continued interest and, and growth in in this segment on your side? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think um, in line with what other panel members have said, hopefully that, you know, increased supply um, to, to match demand will mean that, you know, Greenium isn't isn't so much of a, an issue, um, but definitely something we'll continue to monitor, um, you know, with particularly interest in the secondary market. Um, and yeah, we'll look forward to the next um, publication from Caroline and, and maybe and we'll look forward to maybe sharing some of our uh, insights too. We'd love to. Thank you very much, Lizzie. George, any kind of final thoughts on, on trends to come for this year? Yeah, I think probably picking up on those last couple of points, I think, look, clearly when we're looking at the market, it's investors, issuers. We can't go too far one way or the other. So I think, you know, to Christian's point in terms of the longevity of the greenium, we certainly still see in the near term a number of factors to suggest that it will persist and be available to, to issuers. But on the flip side, as you pointed out in the, in the research, Caroline, there's obviously in, in many cases an improved performance in secondary markets of green bonds um, for various reasons too. 
And therefore, as an investor holding the bonds, having access to them in primary markets, there's an uplift as well. And we see it most strongly in the EU curve, but obviously in a range of issuers too. So I think that's obviously the kind of dynamic at play in some respects. It has to be something for, for both sides of the, the capital markets. Um, and I think you know, the other point in terms of <clears throat> the virtuous circle of investors, issuers and investors setting up um, different strategies and funds, I think the more issuers in the market, the easier it is for an investor to set up the strategy, be it green, be it social. Um, and just on that social point, I mean, that's obviously one topic which is on the forefront of some investors' minds too. A bulk of the supply is dominated by the EU Shore program by another couple of French issuers. And the more issuers that come into the market, the easier it is for an investor to start to set up a strategy and develop that and implement that in, in through their various funds. So I think you know those are the the couple of things on, on the outlook. Um, and you know, I think ultimately when we see the steady state, maybe we do lose a bit of the 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 greenium as as we've touched on a couple of times. But in some ways, maybe that in the medium term, the issuer level analysis starts to dominate and you start to see real outperformance appears within certain sectors as we get increased data availability and implementation of, um, let's say, a top-down issuer approach, which I know lots of investors do implement anyway. So I think those are probably the few things which, which we see developing in the near to medium term. That's great. Many thanks, George. Um, and uh, Heather, any, any thoughts from your side to 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 round up, round up, especially perhaps on how the the, the buy side is uh, is getting organized around these topics. Yeah, absolutely. I think to, to just kind of build off of what Caroline had mentioned um, and and what Lizzie had mentioned as well. You know, in in speaking with the buy side clients that are trading on TradeWeb, we do see the grand majority have some sort of ESG or sustainable investment consideration. Obviously, to varying degrees depending on the the investment advisor um, themselves, the size, um, so on and so forth. Um, but we do see you know, that increased demand. Um, from across kind of uh, global participants on the platform. I think what's interesting and kind of in keeping with this conversation, obviously Europe uh, as a region being the largest cumulative green bond issuer, we're also seeing the largest trading volume out of Europe, uh, both European government bonds and European credit bonds making up nearly 80% of the trading volume on TradeWeb. So it'll be interesting to see kind of as more issuance comes into the market, how that will affect trading. Um, will we see kind of a um, increase in, in trading with issuance? Will we start to see different patterns in the market? And that's you know, something that we've been we've been tracking closely and, and look forward to seeing kind of how those the issuance dynamics play out into into the secondary market moving forward. It will be interesting to see the the development in this this coming year. Um, thank you all. Um, Lizzie, Heather, Christian, George, it's been really a, a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation very much. Um, for anyone who's interested in the, uh, in the, in the paper, we've included it in the link. Uh, it's also available on our, on our website. And uh, please do reach out for, for, for further discussion on this topic. We're always happy to chat about green bonds. Uh, so thank you all again. And thank you again to, uh, to TradeWeb for the support as well. Have a nice end of to the day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye.